I'm going to speak from my chair in solidarity with Feral. Thank you. It's got nothing to do with needing to keep my bladder intact. <laughs> thanks to the organizers for putting together this incredibly important discussion. And thanks for the privilege of your presence and being able to speak to you, as well as to some of the trolls who will be watching this on YouTube. Goeiemorgen, meneer van Riebeek. I'm going to make four sets of remarks. I hope no one will run away during the coffee break, and then we can be in dialogue about these and also the excellent remarks uh, from the other panelists that I'm sure you want to engage and I'd like to engage as well. The first two sets of remarks are about the nature of racism and the conceptual distinction that I want to pick up on um, in Ferrell's remarks. And then the final two sets of remarks will be specifically to the questions about the media. And the, re the reason I order them is that in part, the answer to the question, what should the parameters of the debate be, I hope to, to role model in my remarks that don't even reference the media, the first two. The first of them is the question, what is the nature of racism? It's a very difficult question. We don't talk about this question. There's an example of what in the parameter of the debate doesn't take place. I'm not convinced that there's a mathematical truth to the issue. I think in dialogue, we can all come up with different elements to racism. I just want to put three on the table for discussion. The first is that racism should not only be conceived of in terms of racist action. I think it lets us off the hook, both personally when we've committed an act that is a racist act, because we can take that as reason to think of ourselves as otherwise a really nice guy. I just got it wrong on this particular occasion. In line with what Colella said about the cultural core of racism, I think we need to think of racism as being about more than action and that someone who's genuinely racist displays a set of attitudes and character traits, what some philosophers call vicious ill will in relation to people who are different to themselves. And that's very important because when you talk about a racist act, you under-describe the full nature of racism. A second characteristic of, nature of racism that we don't unpack in our public discussions, be it in the media, the academy, or around the bri, is, and this is crypt notes from a recent conversation with uh, Lewis Gordon, that I think we can import it into our public debate, is that at the heart of racism is an incredible narcissism. Part of what it means for me, the racist, to be utterly flabbergasted that you got the job and not me is a presumption of inherent better skill, better dessert or greater dessert on my part for that job. And if you think about that, that surprise that, oh my God, Ferial got the editorship. Why not Chris Roper? Part of what is going on there, quite literally and psychologically, is narcissism in the heart of the racist displaying itself as disbelief, as a sense of injustice, and of course, until proven otherwise, the assumption that it's just an affirmative action point, appointment and the person is actually not deserving. So those are the first two traits that I think we don't speak about enough when we talk about the nature of racism. It's not just about action, it goes to the heart of attitudes, your orientation towards other groups, the quality of the will in relation to other groups. Secondly, at the heart of racism lies a basic narcissism that unsurprisingly doesn't surprise the, the racists because they don't reflect on it. There's a third trait that I want to put on the table before I move to the second issue. There's an incredibly important relational dynamic to racism. Racism happens, the risk of being utterly banal, between people, not an individual. So while it's great that John can talk comfortably to fellow white South Africans, or that I might be able to do that in respect to our fellow black South Africans. What are we going to do about our inferiority as black people? If all white people disappeared in a puff of magic tomorrow, what are we going to do? How are we going to live differently? The reality is we're never going to deal with racism completely unless we keep in mind the relational quality, which means that we need to be in dialogue with each other as black and white South Africans as we search for that answer. My inferiority as a black person, to put it most simply, is not going to be dealt with by only speaking to fellow darkies. 
because the most I will get is confidence amongst blacks. What I really need to confront is my fear of speaking to a white person who has incredible amounts of social capital I didn't have, who's more articulate than me, who was born into a middle class family, didn't have to worry about being a first generation graduate. Those are the fears that hold me back in corporate Santa. I can't rehearse accepting my own confidence and humanity if I speak only to black people. And I think we lose that relational element. On the second question, we need to decide what is our goal, non-racialism or non-racism. I'm gonna state my view. We can debate it afterwards, just in the interest of time. Non-racism should be what we should eliminate in South Africa. Non-racialism is innocuous, but not a necessary goal to have. The difference between them is very simple. Racialism just is the recognition that morphological traits, skin color, hair texture, are social markers that have allowed horrible people like Vervur to come up with a political and a social project that distinguish blacks from Indians and other ridiculous fine-grained social distinctions, different kinds of colored people. That's what racialism means, just recognizing that right now, you being addressed by a colored person, maybe a black person, depending on what political hat you want to wear. But no one in this room thinks that they're listening to a white person. You lying if you say that. <laughs> what I don't mind about racialism is that there's nothing intrinsically wrong with difference. Anywhere in nature, anywhere in biology. Racism is when you take that recognition of racial differences and turn it into unjustified discrimination. That is the enemy. Unless and until someone can give me a logical argument or a very strong empirical argument for why racialism necessarily entails racism, I will continue to self-identify as black, I will continue to think of Max Dupree as white, and my family will continue to laugh at me because they think I'm colored, and that it's only middle-class colored people or the ones from the UDF who have the luxury of thinking they're black African. <laughs> Those concepts are not incoherent. It's part of our lived realities, and we need to distinguish. And the reason why it's dangerous, actually, if you want to be practical about it, is because part of the work we need to do in, re in relation to reducing racism's vestiges can't be done if we, if we define non-racialism as an ideal, and by that we mean color blindness, that all you are seeing on the stage are five inner beauties, not five raced individuals. So there's actually also an instrumental reason, quite apart from the fact that distinctions are not inherently bad, it depends what you do with them, I think there's something we lose instrumentally if we don't, if we don't keep that distinction between non-racialism and non-racism. I don't want to live in a racist South Africa. I'm perfectly okay with living in a South Africa in which my good friend Scott thinks of me as one of his black friends because it doesn't follow from that that we can't have quality relations. Truth be told, there's an intimacy between me and Scott, and it's a real example, sorry to put you on the spot, Scott. There's an intimacy, a richness, a texture, a narrative in terms of our friendship that is way deeper than anything I have with even my sisters. They just don't share my life the way he does. So it's absolutely bullshit to think that recognizing racial differences entail racism. On the question of how the media is doing, the answer is badly. And the reason it's the, 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 the media does the race debate badly and don't set up the parameters is because we are stuck at the level of calling for debates. I made this point last week in a mini essay on IOL that people think it's an intellectual, a moral virtue even. Uh, the Jay Naidu's, Jonathan Youngson's, and many editors to say, let's call for debate. We're calling for a debate. I mean, it's a rhetorical device, it's emotionally safe because you're not staking a position. What we really should be doing is say, Eusebius, I agree with you about your characterization of racism. Here's what's missing in your phenomenology of racism. Or Eusebius, here's where your distinction between non-racialism and non-racism sucks. Or here is where you've done too much philosophy and you're not paying attention to what the social science evidence tell us the empirical link is between racial features and racism. We're not setting up those debates. We're not asking ourselves in the media, what are the success criteria for knowing we have now arrived at where we'd like to arrive? And then in support of what Johnny say, we're not even doing something much less intellectually interesting. We're not even recording people's stories of their lived experiences as race individuals in this country. We're not even doing that. And the reason we don't 
is complete and utter unnecessary intellectual laziness on the part of reporters and editors in this country, be they independent media, News24, or TMG, and it is seen as an achievement to say, I call on a debate on race, next week I'm gonna find five prominent South Africans, they can have their say, you shut the debate after that, you don't go back to the issues. Why are we not drilling down to the question, what is race? Do races exist? Is it a biologically stable property? If it is not, is that a problem? If race is only a social construction, does that mean we can't talk about it? Does race policy language mean that we will necessarily reserve, revert back to a saturated racist society like before? That's the race debate. The race debate is when you pick one of those questions, you think about it hard, you go read what amazing people have said about it, you come up with your own position, you stake it and you put it in the public space. All we see in the media currently is either silence, <laughs> alternatively a clarion call for debate as if asking for a debate is a is a moral achievement the final point i want to make is that the reason why the media gets it wrong besides utter laziness at an intellectual level is also because the media sees itself as above the fray as somehow this incredibly objective source of non-power that is not an agent in society and if you're not an agent in society you don't have to feel any pressure as a group as an industry about how your power is exercised meanwhile back at the ranch the decisions you make on a daily basis what stories to cover what stories not to cover who to leave out do you only go for the most violent story about racism or do you record the insidious small examples that john was talking about all of those choices whether you think about how those choices impact the race debate that i have given parameters to or not doesn't mean you don't have that power and i think besides being lazy the other reason the media doesn't do better is because there's a failure to recognize itself as a ginormous source of power in society thank you Thanks,